Hi, I'm John Palmer. I'm the author of How to Brew, and I'm here today in uh, beautiful Minneapolis. It's kind of an exception to the rule, I think. But uh, here at Northern Brewer, at their fine new uh, Minneapolis store, it's really one of the nicest stores I've ever seen. Uh, great layout, great uh, classroom here. And uh, today I'm going to be brewing a batch of what we call Palmer's Oaked Mild. Uh, this is a mild uh, recipe. Mild being a British style, um, similar to a brown ale, but lower gravity. Uh, my name is Alon Clegus Munt. I've been working at Northern Brewer uh, since November. I actually helped put together the Minneapolis store here. Today I'm helping John Palmer brew his Oaked Mild. So we're having a lot of fun and uh, sipping a few brews throughout the day. This is the way I used to brew when I was brewing at home, at home in my kitchen. Um, as uh, my, my equipment has changed over the years, now I'm brewing more on the Blickman top tier system with, with um, the, metal, the stainless steel pots you know, on all three burners. But um, you know, starting out all grain, a uh, 10 gallon got cooler is your best, your best tool. And uh, this is how I used to brew. So we're gonna be mashing in the cooler. Uh, we're gonna have two pots going, we're gonna have our heating up our initial mash water in our boil kettle. We'll use that to feed the mash and then we're also heating up another eight gallons of water for sparging in, uh, in another kettle here on the stove. Depending on the equipment you have, you can go to two coolers like with the Northern Brewer Deluxe All Grain System. In this case we would be putting this HLT water, this uh, sparge water, in this top cooler and gravity feeding this water to the top of the mash during our sparge. And that would be what we call continuous sparging where you, you trickle the wort out as you trickle the sparge water in and you get a nice transfer of and rinsing of the grains um, and get very high efficiency that way. What we're going to do today is we're going to do a batch sparge. Batch sparging is a little easier to accommodate in you know, the typical kitchen. These are Camden tablets and one tablet will treat 20 gallons uh, we're only going to treat eight gallons with this one towel here, but uh, more doesn't hurt. It's sodium or, uh, sodium or potassium metabisulfite. And uh, it, when you do this to treat the water to get rid of the chlorine, you end up adding about 10 ppm of sulfate, which is pretty negligible amount, really. I mean, compared to the other salt additions we'll be doing later. So, but one can tablet will take care of all your chlorine or chloramine uh, problems with your source water. Drop that in there. Okay, so what we have here is uh, four grams each of calcium chloride and calcium sulfate. The water in the Minneapolis area is um, pretty soft. It's surface water from the, you know, mainly from the rivers. And uh, so it's very low hardness, low alkalinity. What we want for any beer really is you usually want between 50 and 100 parts per million of calcium. Those levels of calcium uh, help the fermentation chemistry, they help the mash chemistry. Um, it's just a 50 parts per million of calcium is the, the starting point of where you want to be. Um, and, in, and anywhere up to 100 parts per million works great. So what we're doing here is we're adding uh, these uh, total of eight grams of uh, calcium sulfate and calcium chloride to eight gallons of water. Uh, that's going to give us a total calcium content of about 83 parts per million, which is you know right in the middle there. Um, this will give us a residual alkalinity in the neighborhood of eh, somewhere between zero and 60 uh, RA, which is good for a uh, tan beer style, you know, an amber, dark amber. Um, it's kind of this very middle of the road area in terms of brewing. Uh, we're assured of good beer pH. And that's what we're looking for when we do salt additions like this. Looking at the temperature of the strike water in the cooler, we are a couple degrees low uh, to what we are, what Beersmith said our target uh, strike water temperature should be, uh, which calculated about 158. We are coming in at 156, you know, around there. Um, and uh, you know, it's two degrees, but that could change our target mash temp from 152, which is, you know, really good, to around 150 or maybe even 148, depending on more heat loss once we dumped everything in the cooler and stirred. Um, and you don't want too low a mash temperature because then conversion occurs more slowly and uh, the mash will take longer. 
Um, you do get a higher fermentability from a lower mash temp, but uh, low you know, high, or high fermentability is not really the goal of this mild recipe. We're looking for good middle of the road fermentability. So it's a lot easier to take a portion of the water out of the uh, cooler. We're going to bring this to a boil or get it up higher and then add it back and check our strike temperatures. Um, about an OG of about 1038, you know, the, the mid to high 30s. Um, Maris Otter malt um, as the base, and then some specialty malts uh, like one pound of Crystal 60 uh, for a, I'm talking in terms of five gallon batch, um, half pound of Brees Special Roast. Special Roast is an interesting malt. It's like a it's like a biscuit, but it's um, it's kilned a little differently. And it's got a real depth of uh, bread crust and biscuit and you know, different melanoidin flavors, but not as much as like a Munich. On top of that, the, the Maris Otter pale malt and the special roast, we've got a half pound of flaked wheat. We've got a quarter pound of chocolate to give a little, you know, that color um, that you expect from a mild. And then we've got the half pound of toasted oats. And all of these, all these malts kind of combine to give, you know, a, a nice deep amber color um, and a complexity to the, to the bread crusts and biscuit and cookie flavors that we're looking for in this beer. I'm going to drain uh, two to three quarts into this pitcher um, to help set the grain bed. I'll pour it back in. Do a couple more and I'm looking for coming through the tube is I'm looking for fair clarity um, you know the it's not going to be clear it's not going to be like apple juice it's going to be like apple cider what I'm looking for is to make sure I don't have any bit noticeable pieces of grain coming through the hose um, we want to set the set the mash bed over the false bottom get get that filtering going and be looking for a substantially f particle free wort coming out that's the Vorloff step or recirculation step for clarity. And it's, you can see some stuff coming through, but as we, as we drain and, re, and start recirculating, that's going to drop off. Yeah, we got a real nice color. Um, and we did, we took a refractometer reading a few minutes ago and we're getting about 1070, which is typical for first runnings. So I'm going to close this and pour this back in. With the grain bed as deep, in the, you know, the, the lauder tun as deep as this is, pouring this back in isn't going to really stir anything up. So you can see through the hose and in the bin there, we're not seeing any particles coming through. We're just seeing a nice, you know, amber work. It's, uh, it's pretty clear. So I think we've got, we've got our recirculation successfully completed here. We've set the grain bed. I'm going to pour the recirculation uh, wort back in the tun and now we will drain to the boil kettle. And that's the nice thing about batch sparging is in, you, know, you, you simply drain the wort that's there to the boil kettle and then you add more water, stir it up, recirculate again and drain again. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, thought is taken out of the process. Continuous sparging is nice um, if you've got a gravity setup, kind of like what we've got set up here, where if we had all of our water in this second cooler up here, um, we could gravity feed uh, uh, water into the mash tun slowly and slowly drain the mash tun through this hose into the boil kettle and achieve a nice slow rinsing and, and moving the, the sparge water through the grain bed um, rinsing the, the, the grain and getting a nice uniform uh, uh, rinse going. Continuous, you know, doing that slow rinsing takes a while. It you should spend anywhere from half an hour to an hour sparging if you're doing a continuous sparge to ensure that you're not channeling or, you know, running the, the, the sparge water down the side of the cooler to the drain because um, that's when you really leak at pore efficiency from your lauder. So when you do a continuous sparge, it's got to be slow and to get, make sure you get the uniformity. Um, with the batch sparge, you're not, re, you're not planning on um, rinsing of the grain as a function of flow. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're drawing off the wort, the first runnings we call it, 
putting, then dumping more water in, stirring, you know, taking the residual sugars out of the grain, and uh, and and it's like a tea bag where you're 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 steeping the grain in this new hot water, setting up a concentration gradient, extracting the remaining sugars, making a homogeneous solution of the remaining sugar in the grain, and then draining that wort out. If you're to do the batch barge a third time, um, or the same time, uh, then you would pull out some more, but it's a gradually diminishing return. Uh, you know, two, for, two runnings, the initial first runnings here that we're going to do, and then one sparge or one, the second runnings is really all you need to do in batch sparging. Not going to drain too fast. I don't want to, you know, uh, rapidly compact the grain bed, especially as we can start getting, you know, lower down. Uh, the wort level will get lower. And, uh, but it's running off nicely. One of the nice things about working with the Blickman Boilermaker pots is the sight glass on the side. And when you're batch sparging, it really helps to know your volumes. You, to get the best efficiency of a batch sparge, you want the, you want the two sparge volumes to be the same. Ideally, the, your first running should be half of your boil volume. Your, then you dump in your sparge water and recirculate and drain that second running's volume should also be half of your boil volume. And having the sight glass on the side of the, the boil kettle makes that you know, volume determination a lot easier. We're looking to collect about five, five to six gallons, uh, well, probably five, five gallons out of our 10 gallon batch here in this first running, so we'll see what we get. And then we'll, we'll uh, sparge with uh, about six gallons uh, to get our, uh, our boil, vo boil volume of 11 to 12 gallons, uh, which we expect to get about a 10% evaporation rate and uh, end up with uh, you know, roughly a 10-gallon batch going to the fermenter. So one comment I'll make when you're, when you're draining a batch sparge is uh, you know, beware of your flow rate. The, the laudering in batch sparging is not flow rate sensitive, but keep in mind that we've got a false bottom in this cooler and if we were to open up the valve wide open and drain as fast as we can, chances are we would suck the grain bed down and end up with a stuck sparge. I mean, you know, we don't want to leave any work behind in this first running. So we want to drain it all. So I'm not opening it up wide open because I don't want to suck the grain bed down and, and compact it and get, you know, get a stuck sparge. Um, so I've got it, you know, halfway. We've got a good flow rate coming in, um, and I, you know, I'm in turn, trying to ensure that we're going to be able to drain the entire mash. Got about five and three quarters gallons out of our first runnings. Uh, it's very good. The, oh, the gravity on this is around 1070, 1075, typical for first runnings. First runnings gravities are entirely, you know, uh, rate, grist ratio based. Most recipes, you know, are in terms of first runnings are uh, roughly the same gravity. It's when, how much you dilute them from there that changes the final gravity. So we're going to take our sparge water, we're going to dump it into um, our cooler. We're not pouring on top of a lid or anything, we don't care about that, we're just going to pour it in. Ooh, we are going to be close. Sweet. Now we'll just uh, stir this up again. And what we're doing with the batch sparge is we've, we're stirring up the grain bed that was previously set and we're going to you know, re-soak re all the grains. We're going to take we're, this new water that we've put in is uh, going to help diffuse out any residual sugar that's in the grain. and. Uh, Trying to stir around the edges, make sure that I get all the grain kind of exposed to the new water here. Then we'll recirculate and uh, drain again. And that's all there is to it, to this method of sparging. It's, you know, it takes, if, if you're brewing in your kitchen or your apartment and, uh, you know, you don't have room for a gravity fed system or something like that or a pump, uh, this, you know, takes a lot of the effort out of uh, sparging. One question I get asked a lot is, you know, about acidification of sparge water or, 
you know, do I need to change the chemistry of the sparge water? In general, what you're doing if, when you're trying to change the pH of sparge water is you're trying to bring down alkalinity. If you're a brewer in Texas or out west, other places out west or Fargo, North Dakota, for instance, where you, or anywhere where you're sitting on, um, the ground, you're using groundwater from, uh, that's heavily alkaline, you know, limestone aquifers and so on, you get high alkalinity water, which has a pH of like eight and a half to nine. High alkalinity water, when you sparge, is gonna drive the mash pH from the, the five two to five five range, it's gonna drive it up towards the sixes. And when you get up towards a pH of six, then you start extracting more tannins from the grain husks, you start extracting more silicates from the grains, um, and that's when you get the, the, the very astringent tastes out of the beer very grainy or very drying on the palate. Uh, and that's why people that live in those areas, they will talk about adding acid, acid to the sparge water. They'll try to bring the, the pH of that water down to say six or something. But here in Minneapolis, where we're working with surface water and low hardness, low alkalinity surface water at that, um, sparging with this water is not gonna change the mash pH. The grains have organic you know, buffers in them, and uh, they, that, those buffers in the grain will maintain the mash pH for us. The sparge water is not going to significantly change that. So whether you're fly sparging or batch sparging, uh, at this point here in Minneapolis, we do not need to add acid. Now we're going to recirculate again, um, reset that grain bed. Really only five minutes has passed since we've added the sparge water um, and stirred it up again. And now we're recirculating. You can see that the work color is lighter. But uh, as we're gonna, we're gonna drain about you know three quarts here, and then put it back and drain a little more, looking again for a substantially clearer work coming through the tube. And once we've achieved that, then we will drain again to our boil kettle and and uh, proceed with the boil. Yeah, open about the same, and we're off and running. No pun intended. Now we're pulling out about. Four bricks. Okay. It's about starting gravity or specific gravity of 1016. Yep. So we're getting our six gallons of 1016. Um, that's uh, what another 32, eh, you know, almost another 64 points of sugar going in from this sparge. We're at what 45 degrees C. If we'd be down around, uh, it, higher temperature drives the pH lower. Now the pH has moved down to 5.3, 5.2. Five, um, five, yeah, we're definitely in ballpark of where we want to be for the mash pH. Here we, you can see we started our boil. We've gone through the hot break, actually. Um, we're at the 45 minute mark of our hour. So in other words, it's been boiling for about 15 minutes. We're going to do our single hop addition here at 45 minutes. This is uh, half East Kent Goldings and half of Progress. Um, we're doing it at 45 minutes um, as opposed to an hour. That will result in a little bit of hop flavor carry carryover. Mostly it's gonna be bitterness though. Um, conceivably we could go with an, an, you know, a 60 minute addition of another hop, a high alpha hop, and, you know, and not plan on any hop flavor making it through, but uh, since this is a mild, it doesn't count on a hot presence, but we like a little bit of hot presence going into this particular recipe, and that's why we're doing it at 45 minutes. So we'll dump those in, and we're done with our hop addition. I typically brew all grain myself. Uh, I do still do quite a few extract batches. Um, even though I'm not brewing uh, the number of batches a year that I'd like to, um, I do have uh, a couple of favorite beer recipes that are extract only. I do a 100% wheat malt extract um, lawnmower beer that's Noble Hops 10, 1045 OG um, and it's just an easy drinking summer beer but the, I feel the wheat malt gives it a, a little lighter palate than a, you know, an all barley malt extract of the same gravity would. Brewers shouldn't have any prejudices again about the method they're using for, for brewing, um, you can do extract only because we've got great extract these days. 20 years ago when I started brewing, uh, you know, all the extract we were getting was old. And 
you know, there is a real aversion to liquid malt extract because of it. usually it had been it sat around for a couple of years. Um, we we promoted using dry malt extract as uh, having longer shelf life and being more stable and getting a little better beer out of it. Um, there was a real push then to get into all grain brewing because then you got better freshness and better flavors out of the beer. But these days, extract is really fresh and brewing with extract can make great beers. Um, I, I have no doubts about that. Moving the chiller around in the pot, you get better chilling. Can you know, get, some, get some wort movement. Um, not trying to whirlpool anything at this point. All I'm doing is moving the wort around with the chiller just to keep, to keep, uh, keep it moving, make sure I um, don't get any stratification of temperature. So often uh, people are siphoning to, you know, using a siphon to transfer from the pot to the fermenter. And so often plastic hoses get contaminated and you know that will just inoculate an infection right to the fermenter. I recommend that everybody exchange their vinyl tubing uh, if they're using a siphon, you know, exchange that out every six months, you know, depending on your brewing frequency. You don't want to take a chance on not getting contaminated. The nice thing about having a pot like this with a with a spigot on it, um, you know, is that you can you can get a fresh piece of tubing, stick it on there, or in this case we got quick disconnects, drain it right to the fermenter. Um, cleanliness of the fermenter, um, cleanliness of the room you're in, because I mean, granted, you know, let's say you're going to take this now, and this would be more applicable to a five-gallon batch and you're gonna dump it into a five gallon bucket. You know, if you're doing this in the garage or in the wood shop or, you know, outside, you know, any, anything in the air is getting mixed into that, that batch as you're pouring it. Um, and you can, you know, you can get some beer spoilage, uh, wild yeast and so on going at that time. Um, so it's really, when you're doing work transfer, now that we're, we're chilling it, it's gonna be cool um, it's best to do that under, as un, under a controlled condition as possible. Um, very low air movement, clean room, uh, just, to, just to play it safe. Here's, here's our beer, the final result. We've got it transferred to two fermenters here. Um, nominally a 10 gallon batch, but I always kind of go over like 11 in this case. So we have more beer to, to fill up and then when we actually rack to the keg, we get a full five gallon keg. Um, our final gravity came out at 1039, which is you know right where we wanted to be. Maybe just a touch high, but you know right really where we wanted to be with it. Um, tasting the hydrometer sample, it's got a really nice upfront bitterness that doesn't last. I mean, it, the, the 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 finish of the beer is uh, more of the sweet and and cookie and and uh, bready maltiness that we were really really looking for. So I have a high hopes for this beer. The plan right now is that one of these fermenters will be oaked and the other one won't be. And uh, since I won't be around uh, the, after this weekend uh, to taste them, uh, they're gonna bottle up a few bottles for me and send it to me. And then uh, hopefully we can do an online tasting session over Skype where uh, I, I can taste them alongside Alon and, and others to uh, kind of comment on the beer. And it uh, should be a lot of fun.